Hi everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Sci, the art and science of watch collection. Uh, today what I want to do is being a watch snob, but on a budget. In other words, you don't have a lot of money, but uh, you want to be a watch snob. But what is a watch snob? Really, I think of, for me it is anyway, a watch snob is somebody who's a watch collector who really appreciates sort of the better elements of watchmaking. Uh, for me especially, it centers around the movement. However, it also includes the dials and some other aspects uh, that go into a watch, the case, the band, everything. Um, so how do you do it on a budget? Okay, now when, I, when I'm talking about a watch snob, I'm not necessarily talking about the most popular watch. Uh, let me tell you something that happened at a, uh, at a watch show I went to. I went to uh, the Watch Time show in uh, New York City a number of years ago. And I think I had at the time, I just got an FP Journe and I was sporting it. And uh, they weren't as expensive as they are now, believe me. But everybody was saying, oh, you know, what you got? And I got this and I got that. And and this one guy said, oh, he said, is that a, a FP Journe? I said, yeah, I, just, I got this and showed it to him. And I said, what do you got? And I, I think it's sort of like, he said, well, I only have a Rolex. Now, in that context, the, you know, the, the Rolex guy wasn't being a snob. He somehow felt that having one of the most popular, in fact, probably the most popular luxury watch in the world was somewhat lesser than. Okay, so I just, just remember, just keep in mind the context of watch ownership. Now, is the Rolex owners I know, for the most part, they just like the watch because it works well, it keeps good time, they like the looks of it, the feel of it, and everything else about it. So that's, you know, that's not being a, a snob nor sort of a, I don't know what, <laughs> a non-snob. Uh, however, uh, I quickly realized once I got into a uh, watch collection, especially since I had recently retired, that I got to find a way to <laughs> get some of these watches that I want. Uh, but, you know, is there a way to afford them? Well, what I found early on was that I got this, uh, this Harry Winston. This is a Harry Winston by retrograde. And um, I was very interested in the uh, movement in it and so forth. I figured, well, Harry Winston's a well-known jeweler, but, you know, what do they know about watches? Well, it turns out that they they were pretty smart about watches because what they would do is they would hire the very best people uh, who were watchmakers. Uh, in this case, two of them were Roger de Bouy and Jean-Marc Viderec. Jean-Marc Viderec was the very first watchmaker to win Watchmaker of the Year back in 2007. And so, in getting to Harry Winston, now a lot of people would say, oh, Harry Winston, that's a jeweler, jewelry watch, not a real watch. Well, it turns out that the opposite may be true because uh, where you have these companies, they've got a lot of money, but they don't have watchmakers, and so they have to go out and they find some really top-notch watchmakers. Now, there I've got a couple Chaumet uh, watches. They don't make either one of them anymore, by the way. In fact, I think Chaumet totally quit making men's watches altogether. Chaumet was, the history of Chaumet is one that's just, you know, goes back. They made the hilt jewels for Napoleon's sword and his wife or girlfriend's mistress, one of them, but you know, jewelry for her. And Chaumet is like a very, very wealthy, uh, well-known uh, jeweler. And uh, so when they want, they, somebody decided there at some point, well, let's make, let's make washes. And so they went to, they did two things very interesting. On the one hand, they had a, underneath, they had a very solid uh, ETA movement, nothing fancy, just a regular timekeeping movement. And 
the and then on top of that they wanted to put something fancy and so they had Jean-Marc Viderec uh do the uh do the movement for them or add a module to the movement and the module they uh they added uh was a second hand now they did the second hand in two ways as a regular second hand and also as this ferris wheel and there's this wonderfully slow gradual movement that was because of the module uh that's pictured there next to it they did another one they did the uh Chaumet had something called the dandy metrodome you know, I tell you, if, if you're selling guys' watches, name it something other than a dandy. <laughs> that would be my advice. Uh, but uh, so they, they had one, so it had a metrodome. It's TikTok for, you know, they're using timing music. And again, um, Vita Rec and Aganor did the, uh, uh, did the uh, module for them. Now, one of the other things about some of these top jewelers is the cases they make are incredible. They really make these world-class uh, cases that are way, punching way above their weight as far as, um, you know, whether you like the looks of them or not, that's a one that's neither here nor there. They're really, they're made, they're very well-made cases. Okay, moving right along. Now, we want to be a watt snob, but we don't have a lot of dough, so let's take a look at at the lessons we need to learn. And I think the first lesson is, and it's always the last, last lesson, find out what's inside of it. Uh, here, there's some watches, there are three watches. All three of them have a world-class uh, watchmaker. One of them has two world-class watchmakers. Okay, the second is trying to find an affordable complex function. Uh, I was out looking for a uh, an equation of time watch, and it, it, the prices, even on the used and so-so ones, were were really very very high. Uh, for example, the, the cheapest one I could find, uh, the second cheapest I should say, was a Panerai Luminar equation of time was 11,000 bucks. This I found on uh, Chrono 24 just today. Now, uh, the ones that they're still making, uh, um, they're not, they don't make a lot of them, but this is Breguet uh, Marine Equation. Uh, and that thing is $242,000. You know, well, they stuck a turbione in and they always jack up the price when they do that. But two hundred and forty-two thousand bucks, no way I can afford that. So what I found was this Lone Jeans, with um, it, it's it's a wonderful watch. It's got a an equation of time. It has a a little thing here that you can stop and turn it on. Now this this watch was from nineteen eighty nine when they had some kind of big celebration of 150 years or whatever it was for Lone Jeans. And so they decided to make a special watch. And they somebody said, hey, let's make a, a one with the equation of time and, and sunrise and sunset and some other, and the tilt of the earth. They have all kinds of things on this watch. And, uh, and then uh, on top of it, they put in an enamel dial. Now this was for a very special uh, a, a special watch because of the occasion of the anniversary. And so that's another thing you can do is that you don't have to find the most expensive watch to find a function that you want. Um, now, I happen to watch the equation of time, and there are not a lot of them. There are not a lot of these, these uh, the long jeans. I found uh, one on eBay today for $21.94, 2000 bucks for a watch that <laughs> Two hundred and forty-two thousand, or even eleven thousand. Eleven thousand was the bottom price for one on uh, Chrono Twenty-Four. Found one. So this is one of the things I think that that's important is that because of a really special function you want doesn't mean you have to pay a lot of money. You can find a really good one if you look around. And, and I mean, really look around. 
Okay, the next sort of this is in lessons how to be a cheapskate and a snob at the same time. You can find really quality movements in what are usually seen as luxury brands. Uh, one of my favorite is this Rolf Lauren. Now, Rolf Lauren is like, I don't know, I, I guess they're the ones that, are they the one with a horsey on it? I'm not sure which they are, but they're, they're, they've got, they're, when you hear Rolf Lauren, you don't think of great horology. But I was, I was going through the uh, watchbase.com and I found a Ralph Lauren Caliber RL 939 that was, and I looked at the base of it, and it was a, um, it was a Jajar Lecoutre 939A. In other words, here's this watch, and it, I found one for 27.50. I mean, that was one of the things about this, a Ralph Lauren Sporting Wolf Time. That's the one with it. Not all of them have that in it. Uh, but I found one for twenty-seven fifty, which not only is a good price for just about you know any watch with a world timer in it, but one with a Jager Lecoutre, this is a great thing. And so the the thing about that is is that you can find some great deals in terms of again being a snob. <laughs> you want to be a snob, you got to have good movements and. Uh, this Jajar Lecoutre certainly is one. They can call it Ralph Lowen's dog if they want, as long as it, it's got good stuff in it. Now, one of, the, one of the things about this is that there's this place called watchbase.com. Learn to use that. Uh, the Ralph Lauren watch I just talked about, that's how I found the Jajar Lecoutre movement in it. Now, at the same time, you can have high price brands with low price movements. This isn't to say the movements are bad. They're just, you can find the same thing for a lot less. I mean, the same movement. Now, uh, here's one is the example is the IWC Portofino Automatic. Now, there's nothing wrong with having an inexpensive movement. Uh, both of these have a Salida SW300 dash 1a however one cost over five thousand dollars and another is under two thousand dollars and so it it's it's very important now iwc sort of has two tiers of movements unfortunately they don't really say okay here's our this is if you buy this watch you're getting a salita 300 and if you buy this watch, you're getting an in-house built IWC XYZ, whatever movement they have. The only, or one of, and, and they don't have everything, but watchbase.com is very important. In this particular case, I simply looked up, I uh, went there, found out, this by the way is a retail uh, MSRP price. Uh, they said it's a caliber 35 uh, 111. 35111 is a Salida 3 SW300, <laughs> you know, which is not an expensive uh, movement. Uh, so, anyway, uh, believe me, IWC is not the only one that does this. So does, um, uh, let me see, I've seen it in a lot of different ones. Um, Tag Hoyer, for example, a lot of theirs, they have other names for it. And just, I mean, it's just there's certain brands that do that. And they have, usually they have two kinds of movement. At one time, Tudor had ETAs and then they started having their own. In fact, they still may. So it's good to check on that. But then they started making more and more of their in-house movements. I'll, get, I'll talk about a bit about that more. This other one is a Sen uh, 856. And one of the things about, it's a German watch thing about most German watches, most popular German watches, is they have Swiss movements. And most of those Swiss movements, they used to be ETA, now they tend to be Solita. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some of the German watches have some of the best movements by German watchmakers, like anything by Marco Lang, Stefan Kadoki, <coughs> uh, Moritz Grossmann, 
all along at Unsunda. Those are those are really top ones, but they're also top wise price wise. Okay, moving right along. Another one is you can find affordable watches by top watchmakers. Now this is going to take some some doing, okay? Uh, and I have a number of different examples here, and the prices are all over the place. Now let me tell you something. After the pandemic, when the prices went up on a lot of different watches, they also went up. Suddenly, people discovered a lot of these watches. Um, I had a, uh, a Daniel Roth. In fact, I have a couple Daniel Roth ones that were several thousand dollars less than sort of the, you know, what you can find one for today. I think they start around seven thousand, uh, and these are these are, are really fantastic watches. The movements in them. Uh, Daniel Roth worked a lot with Lamania, and so his watches, he will start with Lamania and end up with his some his VR uh, caliber of one type or another. Um, Roger Debuy is another brand. Uh, I had one of those and got another one, uh, sort of a traded one for the other. The Roger Debuy, the new ones are so expensive that they're, they're sort of way up there. They're excellent movements, though, in a Roger Dupuy, and it's one of the few brands that still just about all of their watches have a Geneva seal. However, early on, in the early 2000s, and by the way, most of these watches are from the early 2000s. They're sort of like just before they go into vintage, you know, late 90s, some of those. Uh, and so what what you can do if you know if you know who the the watchmaker is you can you know you can out snob just about anybody because you've got a movement that's probably better than theirs if you have a and then with Roger Debuy you get a Geneva seal on top of that and you be in, you just you'll be intolerable to be around that's what a good snob will do <laughs> okay now another sort of a funny one for a year I think like just a year uh, Daniel Roth, his, his, the, he developed, first of all, he sort of brought uh, Breguet out of a hole and developed some of the, uh, the now classic Breguet watches that you see. Uh, but then the people who owned it at the time were Chomet brothers who tried to corner the diamond market and ended up going belly up and almost went to jail over it. So that's an interesting story. So so Daniel Ross started his own company, and that's where you see the ones that, uh, that you see there and the ones I have. But after a while, the company that was sort of supporting him also went bust, and so... Uh, he went to work for um, Bugari. Bugari said, okay, well, we'll we, they bought the brands, is really what they bought. And uh, for a year, he, at least a year, he worked with Bugari. And so a lot of the ones, the movements that he had were transferred over to Bugari. And some of the most important ones uh, and the most expensive ones that are that are Daniel Roth, you can find some better deals in the same essential movements in the Bugari ones. So find a little better deal there. Another guy that a lot of people don't appreciate or even know about is Anton Prezuzio. Now Anton Prezuzio, the he's won uh, he won a couple Grand Prix awards. And most of his watches are these real high, you know, sixty, seventy thousand uh, dollar uh, uh, tourbillons. And but he also has his well, he has his brand, and he sort of has two tiers. One tiers is for just about everybody, and then the other one is for you know people who want something really special and also very expensive. But Antoine Prezuzio has a number of really uh, interesting watches. Again, they tend to be from the early 2000s. Uh, this one, uh, they start around $3,000, right around there. You can find some a little less, a little more, but that's another one you might find for, again, you're looking for a top watchmaker. 
uh, anybody who is who is a member of the AHCI, which is the Independent Watchmakers Association, you have to be voted in. I mean, you've got like Hari Budenlan and F.P. Jorn. You got all of the top guys in that in that organization. One of whom, another one, is Vincent Calabrese. Now, from about six thousand dollars. Now, this is for a new one. You can find some used ones. You don't find a lot of them, but you can find them for less than that. But uh, this particular watch, uh, this is called a Griffey, uh, starts at $6,000 for a brand new one. Now, uh, it's got the sort of a wandering, jumping hour. It's a really interesting watch. And so there's two ones, NHC, there's Vincent Calabrese, and then there's NHC, Vincent Calabrese. There was some kind of deal that I, I think that Calabrese had with, that was named NHC, and that fell apart at some time. And so you can find them both, but sort of a, he's got some very interesting watches. Uh, finally, is Gerald Genta. And uh, Gerald Genta wasn't really a watchmaker. He was more of a, he was a designer, but he designed a lot of interesting watches. And a lot of the uh, movements, in fact, the movements of all three of these guys on the bottom, uh, they tend to be ETA or Salida movements. I think the older ones are ETA, uh, uh, Prezuzio and uh, Calabrese, but they've been totally revamped. The thing about it, if you go to Vincent Calabrese's site and you look at that watch, he's going to tell you exactly the movement that's inside. And that's one thing I really respect about these guys. Uh, Gerald Genta, of course, has passed away, but a lot of his watches that are very interesting, a lot of these retrogrades like uh, the one shown here, that's, you know, that's really a watch that's going to get a lot of interest. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is that is that more and more luxury brands are owning top movement companies, uh, either the whole or in part. Uh, Chanel is one of the most interesting ones. There's this company called Kinesi that was either developed in part or in whole by Rolex and Tudor. And Chanel owns a hunk of it, and they have, so their calibers now are made by uh, Kinesi. Kinesi, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Their first one is uh, the 12.1, uh, Kinesi caliber 12.1. Now, the watch it goes into is a Chanel J12, and they have a guy's version of that, of the J12. And the J12 has a long history to it and uh, most of the older ones have ETA movements and a few years ago, not too many years ago, then they put in the 12.1. Uh, and I think if you're looking for one of those and you like the looks of them, and I happen to like the looks of them a lot, they have a, um, I, I found one for 3,000, right around 3,000 pre-owned. Um, so that's, they also own part of uh, Romain Gauthier's. And so there's a, another Chanel, <laughs> Monsieur, the one I have, except those things start at 40000 So you don't want to, <laughs> if, you're, if you're a cheap uh, snob, you want to avoid those maybe. Now, another brand is Hermes. Hermes bought 25% of Vaucheur Manufacture Fluier. Um, BMF. Now they're owned, Vacher is owned, so sort of the whole thing is part of this vertical organization that the Sandoz Family Foundation has. Uh, they're the ones who also own Parmigiani. But uh, Hermes wanted to have some of their own stuff. Uh, their own movements and some more than just, you know, like give me whatever you got on the shelf. And the, I think they have two that have been done so far. One is the 1837 and there's another one. It was 19 something, 1919 or something like that. That's called a Hermes. 
and also, too, I think there's some Vashur movement. Now, Vashur movement makes a movement for Parmigiani and some other ones. Very high-level movement. Uh, and they cost more <laughs> because of that. Now, the final one I want to talk about is Louis Vuitton LVMH, which stands for Louis Vuitton uh, Morris Hennessy MH, yeah. Uh, and the Louis Vuitton, again, here's a, if there was ever a luxury company that didn't sort of go with washes, it would be them, but they bought a company called La Fabrique du Temps. So they bought their own full-blown <laughs> movement-making company. And uh, one of the first ones they made for them was called the LV60 that I have pictured there. Now, the Voyager GMT has, I think, the movement in it is a, was, I think the base movement may have been something like an ETA or something that was worked over by La, Frique, uh, La Fabrique du Temps. And, uh, but then later on, they came up with this, uh, they had sort of a skeletonized version of the watch, of the Voyager, and uh, they came up with the uh, LV60. And I think that may have, may have some relationship to whatever the movement was originally, but it's like, it's brand new. Now, the whole point of all of this, if you want to be a watch snob, you don't have to be a one that is in debt, all right? In fact, never buy a watch you can't afford. The thing is, is to find watches you can afford, but they have their good quality watches. It's easy to find a cheap watch. That's not a problem at all. You can go to eBay or, you know, <laughs> walk down the street and find one. But finding one has to do with spending some time with it. The one I'm wearing, I've talked about a lot. This is my uh, Fabergé um, Alexi. And I found it, and I think, I think originally these were like eighteen, seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000. Uh, this is in, in white gold, automatic, yada, yada, yada. And, but the thing about it that's important is that it has a Frederick Piguet movement in it. And so it's not the fact that it's Fabergé. Fabergé is like a luxury brand as far as I'm concerned. You know, they'll make perfume and <laughs> Fabergé eggs. It's, it's really looking and trying to find quality. The snobbiness, to be a snob, you've got to find the right quality. Any dope with a lot of money can buy quality or what they think is quality. But to be a <laughs> sort of a poor watch snob, it takes, you've got to look at more than just the surface. You have to find out about horology. And finding out about horology is not like a the worst hard work you could do. If you're a watch collector, you should enjoy watches. And if you enjoy watches, you could enjoy learning about them. Let me know what you think if you're interested in being a watch snob <laughs> or not. Uh, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, opportunity to subscribe if you like. Until next time, this is Bill Sanders for Watch Art Society, the art and science of watch collection.